Um, mainly, I just want at this point to show that the problem of quantum mechanics is solved by doing this, and you get relativity, and you get a way to fully picture these Feynman diagrams. Picture them first for the waves, and then also the way the particles follow them. Um, a lot of work needs to be done to, 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 to show how this applies to solid state, what the implication is for cosmology, um, carrying it over into uh, um, quantum chromodynamics. Uh, uh, I would think any theory that can be expressed in Feynman diagrams can be re-expressed with, with the same mathematics in the reverse wave theory. Whether that's true of gluons and, and so forth, I don't know. But that, that's future work. Yes? Um, let's say you have a source that's putting out real particles, electrons or something, something that, that have mass, how do you avoid the problem of having to have an infinite number of particles being emitted? Because everything is putting out these waves and asking for particles to be sent in their direction, uh, and they're all adding up. Whether it's a detector or not, the walls are asking for particles, everything's... Uh, well, so is, why doesn't the source have to be infinite? The question is, uh, you know, waves could be arriving from all kinds of places and they'd all be asking for particles, so why don't we get an infinite number of particles? Well, again, the, the total flux quantity never changes. You imagine, if you imagine one available state in current quantum theory, all that happens is that can be divided into many pieces, but the total is always the same. So in the double slit example, each little area of the screen is emitting something that scatters and forms one of these little pieces, but the total, the total flux doesn't change, which is why the total number of particles emitted is going to be the same. It's just that it's divided up between the pieces. So these fluxes don't ever come into or go out of existence. They're always there. They just get rearranged by particles in the, the way I indicated before. Now, by the way, quickly with this, um, I hope I'm not jumping ahead too much, but imagine this was a Feynman diagram for an electron coming in. Over here, a pair is created, and the positron moves backwards and the electron goes on out. Current quantum theory would say you have this positive frequency wave, then you get a negative frequency electron wave moving backwards in time, and then a positive frequency electron wave. Now this idea of moving backwards in time, and for that matter, negative frequency in current theory to me made no sense at all. What's actually happening is you have a flux coming in here, a positive frequency flux, which means that the wave fronts move in the other direction. At this point, it interacts with a negative frequency flux, which moves in this direction, but forward in time. I mean, it's not backwards in time yet. And over here, it continues and interacts and has a positive frequency flux. The reason why we say backwards in time is because along this segment, the wave fronts are moving in the backwards direction. See, the time variable is just the way we keep track of the number of phase shifts, if you will, that occur as you go through this diagram. You want to have the right phase of the flux when it comes out so that it adds correctly to all the other diagrams. You're just doing a bookkeeping of how many wavelengths you've gone through as you went through the diagram. So on this segment, because the wave fronts are going the other way, it's as if you put a minus sign in front of the time. But that's not what's actually happening. It's just that the wave fronts are moving in the opposite direction relative to the flux. So, so you can see why it looks like you have an electron negative frequency going backwards in time, but in fact nothing like that is actually happening. Now, when a particle electron comes along, there's no way this pair over here could know in advance exactly when to be generated so that the positron would arrive here at the right instant of time. That is, there's no way if this were still the same flux that's involved in the particle process. What happens in the particle process is the particle electron, as it moves, emits these various fluxes, including a positive frequency positron flux. You see, it emits that because a positron can travel toward the electron and they annihilate and generate a photon. So that positive frequency positron flux is one of the waves it emits. As it approaches, that positive frequency positron flux 
interacts with the photon and the electron flux, and that's what generates the pair. The positron then follows that positron wave to this electron, and they annihilate, and you get the photon. So it's actually the positron flux from the particle and not this flux that the positron will follow. So in, in reality, the positive energy positron only follows a positive energy positron wave. So all of this works out, and in effect, you get the Feynman propagator here. The, the, the negative frequency electron waves look exactly like positive frequency positron waves. So mathematically, it's, it's identical, but nothing goes backwards in time. The negative frequencies make perfect sense. And after all, if you can reproduce the Feynman propagator, you've got to be able to reproduce all the diagrams. So, so that, in effect, is a proof that you're going to get the, the, right, um, the right result from this theory. Nature of the, the what you call the unknown variables. Oh, the hidden variables. Yeah. Um, basically, the 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 additional variables are the ones that would determine when when this particle. If we could go back, uh, yeah, go back one slide, please. <coughs> well. Did, did she hear me back there? Can you go back one slide, please? There, there's a lot of Feynman diagrams of the waves interacting, but the particle is only going to follow one of them. The one that it picks will, will have to be determined by variables in the particle. Um, I've been presenting a diagram for the waves and along with it the diagram for the particles, but remember the waves are doing everything at once. They're interacting everywhere around this other particle with all diagrams. The particle will follow just one, and there have to be variables inside that determine exactly which of these fluxes it will respond to at any time. Um, uh, hopefully we'll learn what they are with more research in the future. But the thing now is, with this theory, it makes sense to start talking about the innards of these particles. In current quantum mechanics, I've always been told it was meaningless even to talk about the innards because the uncertainty principle says that it's uh, meaningless. But there is no uncertainty principle in this theory. So now we're able to separate which of the properties are actually wave properties and which are particle properties. After all, if the particle follows its wave, in effect, the only parameters it needs to carry are the ones that it needs to be able to recognize its wave. The momentum and energy and all those other variables may just be in the waves. That's not to say that they transmit energy to the particle. It's just that those parameters are just what determine the way these vertices take place. And then the particle just follows it. So now we have the ability to start building models for these fluxes and models for the particles. I mean, we, we've done all this work with group theory. But it's all in a vacuum. We just know that the particles come in groups. There's got to be a substratum of some kind. So, you see, I think these fluxes, instead of having a flux for every single different kind of particle, there's probably only one or two basic kinds of fluxes that can be combined in different combinations to correspond to the particles. And by using group theory, we maybe can start to figure out what those combinations are. We've been spending decades on particle physics just coming up with new formulas. We haven't learned anything about what the particles look like. And, and current theory says it's meaningless. I, I think this now provides a basis to start doing some real particle physics. 